Good morrow, friends and countrymen. Gentlemen and ladies, I am very deeply honored, very much humbled to have this opportunity to address you. Mr. Alexander Finney, the worshipful mayor of Williamsburg City, suggested that I make to you some few brief remarks concerning the matter of free speech. He knows full well that I have never in my life been much known for speaking briefly about anything. But nonetheless, I shall endeavor to the best of my abilities in accordance with his wishes. By way of polite introduction, for those of you who are not yet known to me, my name is Henry, Patrick Henry Jr. Esquire, your most humble and obedient servant to command. And I've just recently received a very high and unmerited honor to be appointed to serve as the first elected governor of the Commonwealth of Virginia. I shall endeavor to serve you diligently and well. I suppose that I am rather well qualified to speak upon this particular topic. I blush to say it, but there are some who refer to me as the Demosthenes of the age, others as the voice of the revolution. Others think of me as nothing more than a firebrand or a demagogue, a hothead. Think what you will. I did not have the opportunity, as so many of my fellow associates did, to attend this grand college of William and Mary. Rather, I was schooled into the classical style at home by my father, Colonel John Henry. He was the first on the Henry side of the family to come to these shores, coming from Aberdeen in Scotland. He came armed with only a classical education and a fierce independency of spirit, which he instilled in me. I learned from a very early age that I, as a British subject living here in Virginia, have a basic, fundamental, inherent natural right, the right to have an opinion and to express it freely. Naturally, there are some limits to this particular freedom. For example, if I happen to notice that Mrs. Randolph is most unbecoming in that green and orange dress, I am very wise. Prudence, in fact, and civilities dictate that I keep my opinion to myself. Likewise, if I should defame a gentleman in a public forum, by using what I know to be falsehoods, I subject myself to the very costly litigation of libel or of slander. But friends, things are different when one is speaking about the rights and liberties of the people of Virginia and all America. I consider myself to be the sentinel of the rights and liberties of the people. I speak the voice of thousands. And I did so before I even entered into public life. In December of 17 and 63, I argued a legal cause in Hanover County, many still speak of it, the Parsons cause. During the course of my haranguing the jury, there were cries of treason. Happily, no charges were brought, that is, after all, a capital offense. But it resulted in a very favorable verdict for the people of Virginia, particularly the small dirt farmers. In fact, shortly following that, that uh, jury's verdict, I was picked up upon the shoulders of a large number of men and paraded around the courtyard, electioneering style. And the, final the following year, I found myself elected for the first time into the House of Burgesses, representing the good people of Louisa County. I had sworn the oath of office only eight days prior to introducing my resolutions against the hated Stamp Act. That defense also elicited cries of treason. No charges brought. But I was already distinguishing myself as a rather radical leader, as uh, we entered into greater and greater difficulties with our parent country. Some of you have probably heard of an oration I delivered in Richmond Town at the town church. At least you might be familiar with the final sentence, that of liberty or death. But upon the question of free speech, my introduction, I believe, is something that is most suitable to this current discussion. I recall saying after I was recognized, no man, Mr. President, thinks more highly than I do of the patriotism as well as the abilities of the very honorable gentlemen who have just addressed this house. But different men often see the same subject in different lights. And therefore, I hope it will not be thought disrespectful of those worthy gentlemen, if, entertaining as I do, opinions of a character very opposite to theirs, that I should speak forth my sentiments freely and without reserve. This is no time for ceremony. The question before this house is one of awful moment to the country. For my own part, I consider it as nothing less than a question of freedom or slavery. And in proportion to the magnitude of the subject ought to be the freedom of debate. It is only in this way that we can hope to arrive at truth and fulfill the great responsibility which we hold to God in our country. Should I keep back my opinions at such a time through fear of giving offense, I should consider myself as guilty of treason towards my country and of an act of disloyalty to the majesty of heaven 
which I revere above all earthly things. Just recently here in Williamsburg City, there was an event that took place in the Raleigh Tavern. There was a local merchant by the name of Hardcastle, poor deluded soul, obviously cannot shed his loyalty to the king. He first imbibed a great deal more rum than he should have, and then in a very loud voice began, began making proclamations, making his observations upon the abilities of the Virginia militia. He pointed out that after watching them in drill, that he believed that they were probably going to shoot themselves when they finally were engaged in battle with the British Army, that they didn't know which end of a musket the ball came out of. He suggested that when they did meet British regulars in the field, they would be mowed down as though they were ripe wheat on a cool summer's day. And he longed further that he could be there to observe it. He referred to them as Henry's toy soldiers and other disparaging, demoralizing comments. Shortly thereafter, the local committee of safety of Williamsburg City approached Mr. Hardcastle. They took him forcibly to the street in front of a great number of people. They had a mock trial, pronounced him guilty of treason, and marched him to the Liberty Pole where he was threatened with a coat of thick set, hot tar, and wild goose feathers. They didn't go so far as that, but they did get what they desired, a public apology. Furthermore, his name has been printed in the Virginia Gazettes for all to read, in which he is deemed an enemy to America, an approver of American grievances, and it is recommended in the strongest of terms that none of his countrymen, you, have anything whatever to do with him ever again. In short, civil death. Hardcastle has resolved to, look, to leave the city of Williamsburg, and good riddance to him, say I. You ask my reaction as the governor of the Commonwealth on this behavior and the conduct of the Committee of Safety? I fully support and embrace what they did. My friends, I am now the government. It is my responsibility to keep you safe, and I will not tolerate such demoralizing talk of the men who are sworn to protect you. I see that I have expired my time, but before I take my leave, permit me to offer some friendly advices to you. Be very, very mindful of what you say with regard to the Virginia line, the military line, because there are people listening, and I warrant you, you might find, find yourself presented with a fine new suit of clothes courtesy of your local committee of safety, one made of hot tar and wild goose feathers. I am your servant. <laughs>